and that actually came about around 95 and 90 one time frame when internet suddenly started expanding and we ran out of addresses and um, so somebody said that why don't we have some addresses which are recyclable which can be used by everybody so those are called private addresses private addresses are like 192 anything that begins with 192.168 not 192 192.168 is private 192.169 is not private 192.167 is not private 192.168 is private. Remember that, okay? That would be an exam question. So, any organization can use the number without asking anybody. You don't have to go to IANA and say, can I get an address? You can use in your home 192.168, and all of you are using 192.168 in your home, right? And so that is a private address. The only restriction on the private address is that you cannot use it on the internet. If you send a packet on the internet with address starting from 192.168 or address going 192.168, it will be thrown away. It's a private address. It can be used only in the private network in your own home. Inside the home, you can have lots of computers with that, starting with that address. They can talk to each other. But when you want to go out, you have to use a public address. Yeah. So is there a particular reason why they picked up that number? Yeah, why, I mean, why, why can they choose other numbers? Oh, yeah, yeah, they could choose any number, but those numbers were available at that time that were not assigned to anybody. So they could not choose, for example, 128.252 because that is was assigned to Wustel. And if we made it private, Wustel has to get rid of all its addresses. So actually, this is not the only private address. There are three private addresses, 192.168, and um, I forget, I think 172 and, and, and there is one more. So, but 192, 168 is most common, so we all remember. So there are three sequences which are defined for private use. There is one, I think 10 dot something also is private. But those happen to be the addresses which were available at that time when they made this decision. There is no other significance to it. Actually, uh, this math thing has come up totally out of sequence because the way this book is, is it's top down. Generally, we teach bottom up. So we talk about the whole addressing thing, and there we can go through the whole thing. So when we go to IP, layer 3, there we will have all three numbers, and that time you should probably remember. But right now, you just need to know the function and know 192, 168, because the function is that this is a private address, <coughs> and you can put 0, 1, 2, 3 after that, or you can put you know, 1, 2, 3 to 255. So you have 255 times 255, 2 raised to 16 addresses available to you, right? Because you can put anything in the last two digits. But when you go in the public domain, you have to use public address. And that means you should have at least one public address. So everybody needs one public address, so in your home you have one public address. Right? Vashu has 2,000 public addresses. Actually, Vashu and all the U.S. universities are lucky ones because when the addresses were being given out, there was nobody else, so they all got 2 raised to 16 addresses. Some universities got 2 raised to 24 addresses. Now you cannot even think about 2 raised to 24 addresses. Harvard probably has 2 raised to 24 addresses. But so as the universities came later and later in the game, they started giving 2 raised to eight addresses and then they start giving one address. Now one address is difficult to find in some countries because those came much later in the game. <laughs> so US is in some sense, you know, that's why it has a, it has an unfair advantage of being the leader because we invented the technology and so we, we got all these addresses and names which were for free. Um, and other countries are complaining obviously. So but the idea is that you could have, you need at least one public address. Every organization needs one public address. And every home in USA needs the public address. Every home in China needs the public address, right? So you can imagine the problem in China. Right? And, um, and problem in any other country, name, name your country. But in USA, we luckily have <coughs> public addresses. However, there are not that many public addresses, so we get dynamic addresses in the sense that 
your carrier AT&T or Verizon gives you the address when your com computer is up. When it goes down, it gives it to somebody else. So they are also recycling the same addresses. Yeah. Um, didn't like, IPv6 solve this problem though? Yeah, but IPv6 is not here. Do you have IPv6? I mean, most computers have it built in now. Yeah, most computers have, but no routers have. And so the problem is you can't use it. Have you used IPv6? <laughs> No, nobody has used it. So that's the problem. See, the thing is, IPv6 is here, but not here. And uh, so, so, it, so this is actually solved the problem. The real solution to the address shortage is NAT. Is this NAT, NAT, network address translator takes your un, inside address and translates it to the outside address. And anything coming from the outside is translated back. Yeah. How do you know which yeah, right, I'm coming to that. I haven't described as to how it works. I have just described that there are two kinds of addresses, private and public, and the NAT is the one which does the translation. How does it do it? So basically, let me first go line by line here and make sure that I have done everything before I come to um, how does it do it. So it can be used by anyone and cannot be used on the public internet that we said that NAT overrides the source addresses on all outgoing packets and overrides the destination addresses on all incoming packets. So anything that comes, now the question still remains how does it know which computer it is going to, there are 15 computers inside, but if suppose it find out that yeah, this packet is coming in, so which, pack, which address it should go to, if it knows that it just writes that address and once the packet comes here it goes to the right place. All right. And the way it does it, and this is where it is little bit out of order in the sense that when we go to IP addresses, then we can exactly tell you what it is. But right now, I'm going to try my best. Is that whenever some packet goes out, NAT remembers what was the source port number and what was the source IP address. It changes the source IP address to this number and it changes the source port number to a, some other number. And it makes a table, it says, okay, I put this port number for this address and this port number. See what I mean? It remembers that for all outgoing packets. When the response comes back, the response says to this address, and to that source port number now becomes the destination port number, right? And the response comes back, it looks at the destination address and the destination port number, looks up in that table and finds the right address and the port number. So it actually overwrites both the address and the port number and then the packet is good to go. The question was, can they all have the source port number 80? The answer is yes. So this one sends out a packet that says my source address is 02 and my source port is 80. And this one sends out that my address is 04 and my source is 80. This will give two different source port numbers. The NAT will give two different numbers and put it in the table. It will say, oh, I gave him 3081 and I gave him 3082, right? When the response comes back to 3081, it knows who, who it is for, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So that means like if all of them, the net would have to make, when it sends one out, it has to... Make up a unique number. Yeah, so the everyone's communicating all at the same time. Still yes, the same all time. of them are communicating on all the ports at the same time. Hopefully not all the two raised to 16 ports are used up, otherwise that would be <laughs> a real tough one. In that case, you will really need, that's not a big problem, but if you have so many computers, you probably need more than one address then you have, for each address you can have a table, right? So suppose you have two addresses, you can have two tables. If it's coming to this address and this port, here's the table. If it's coming to that other address, there's the other table, right? So for large networks, you really need more than one public address. This is good for small networks. One address is good for small networks. All right, so. So now you're using, all of you are using, using NAT. Actually, when in your home, nobody has public address. And um, 
and uh, in the university we all have public addresses believe it or not this is a luxury when you log in into wireless today you get 128.252 that's a public address that's a luxury that is not available in many countries and it is going away in the sense that more and more even Bashu and other universities are using private addresses not I mean, they simply because the addresses are not there that many addresses are not there so I mean sometimes you know when you log in as a guest you get 172 point something that is a private address sometimes you get 10 point something that is a private address so so anyway so this is not final thing is Skype so Skype is actually it stands for sky peer to peer okay it's a p2p technology and um, the way they started is that um, your computer connects to somebody else's computer who has agreed to be a super peer and and then they forward your calls to somebody else that you need to go to so there are similar other networks for faxes and other things and obviously um, many of these super peers might as well belong to Skype company as well I mean you know they don't have to really if they can't find a volunteer in some places they can just put their computer and be done with it but um, so when somebody joins, they, they find the nearest super peer, they join with them and they tell them that, look, I'm up. And then there's a distributed hash table and everything else to figure out who is where and how to find them. Okay. Um, and um, if you are inside a net box, if you are inside a private network, then obviously here's the problem with the NAT. I, I should probably go back to this one. Last line. <coughs> NAT doesn't allow you incoming connection. It only allows you outgoing connection. What it means is if you don't go out, nobody can come in to you. So when you, when you send a request, the response comes back. But requests cannot come back. So suppose you put a web server here. Somebody sends a request to this address port 80 and this port 80 is not in the table it will not go but obviously we can make an exception and register all port 80 requests will go to 02 you can make that and you, your router can remember that so you can do port forwarding right that is called port forwarding and nobody else can use port 80 by the way nobody in your network can use port 80 because all port 80 requests will be forwarded to that node then the outside request can come in otherwise you know we have to have the port number outgoing port number before we can have incoming port number all right so NAT means only incoming requests sorry outgoing requests are possible you cannot have a server without having port forwarding which means nobody else can have that port so port forwarding is clear right that um, you have to get somehow on the NAT table and one way to get the NAT table is that you send a request and you automatically get on the table another way is that you register permanently all right so how does Skype get into you well basically um, the way Skype gets is that you open the port 80 or whatever and you, you make a request so now you have a connection set up once you have the TCP connection set up then you have request response going so when a call comes to you it is not a new request it is basically in response to your initial registration thing that you had sent a message out the NAT remember that you have sent a message out everything comes back on that port so the incoming is possible only when you start the outgoing first yeah um, so when you send the outgoing is that basically going to Skype the Skype server somewhere yeah and then after the connection is made do things still go through Skype or is it able to just back and forth right now so the question is 
if this wants to find out where I am, it has to go to the server to find out, and then it finds out that I'm going to go to that server, so that server sends me a request. So the request goes to me through that from that server, right? At this point, I can send a direct connection to that Skype, right? If it is open, if it is not open, then I have to send the request to whatever actually, basically whatever address it comes, it will probably come back with the public address and some port number always, and it will just respond to that one, to that address and that port number, and in different, and so it doesn't have to go through the server again. Okay, so here's the thing. Now let me tell you what I, I use server for. So, I have an FTP server at my home. I have a printer. I have a storage server at my home, right? So if I'm here and I want to access any of those, how do I do that? In fact, um, one of the things I mean, you know, uh, I want to do is um, well. Okay, anyway. So whatever I want to do. Let's say I want to reach my FTP server. So that is on port 21. So I have to register that with my net box. So it gives you access to an internal computer there, right? Yeah, direct access, yeah. That's the last line. Incoming connections are possible only either you have registered permanently or registered on demand. Okay, so this is what is happening now. Port 80 is something that the firewall people cannot close. All right, they can close all other ports. So if suppose I did to my home, I, my, my home and I said port 21, it could be just dropped here, right there, because port 21 is closed. Nobody is allowed to do FTP, okay? But port 80, they cannot close. So every application in the internet today that wants to get inside a private network uses port 80. And so what you do is, um, well, most of the, let me not say let me not say every because that is a very strong statement, and somebody will come up and say here's a counter example. So let's keep it simple. Most of them use port 80 nowadays, and um, and the others basically work on this principle that the client goes and registers with the super node, and the connection is permanent then. So the others work on this principle. that you have already opened whatever port it is, doesn't matter, <coughs> you have a connection with the, with the super node <coughs> and then anybody can get in through that super node connection. Okay? 